Um, thank you for joining and welcome to Lead Dev Bookmarked. Uh, Lead Dev is a global community of engineering leaders who come together to discuss all things leadership, teams, tools, and tech. Bookmark is our monthly book club, and this is our 14th event. I'm Susan Bond, and I'll be your moderator for this discussion. I'm a former COO of a scaling startup and executive coach. My specialty is leaders. You can find me on Twitter at Susan Bond. Today, we'll be talking about Act Like a Leader, Think Like a Leader by um, Herminia Ibarra. Herminia is the, uh, that's Herminia we've been talking to, as you all probably guess. Um, Herminia is the Charles Handy um, Professor of Organizational Behavior at London Business School. Prior to joining LBS, she served on the INSEED and Harvest Business School faculties. An authority on leadership, uh, Thinkers 50 um, ranks Ibarra among the top management thinkers in the world. She is a member of the World Economic Forum's Expert Network, a judge for the Financial Times McKinsey Book Business Book of the Year Award, one of Apolitica's 100 Most Influential People in Gender Policy, a fellow of the British Academy, the 2018 recipient of the Academy of Management Scholar Practitioner Award for her research's contribution to management practice, and she serves on the governing body of the London Business School very busy. Um, she is the author of best-selling books, including Act Like a Leader, Think Like a Leader, and Working Identity, Unconventional Strategies for Reinventing Your Career. Ibarra write, uh, writes regularly in leading academic journals and business publications, including the Harvard Business Review, Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, and New York Times, and speaks internationally on leadership and organizational transformation. A native of Cuba, Ibarra received her MA and PhD from Yale University, where she was a National Science Fellow. Um, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Susan. I'm happy to be yeah, here. Yeah, so good. Um, so every, for everybody, if you have questions for Herminia, please pop them in the Zoom, and I'll be sure to uh, ask them in the, in the Q&A section down there at the bottom of your screen. Um, so I'm curious, how did this book come about? Right. Um, so my first book, which is called Working Identity, was about how people change careers. And um, I was really looking at what happens when you say to yourself, I really don't like this, um, <laughs> not just this job, but this occupation or this field I've gotten myself into. And what can I do instead? And I really um, got into understanding the process that people go through, which can be quite long and elaborate to figure out what next. And it's really, you know, one of the punchlines is that it really is a matter of identity and kind of shifting from an identity that's been dear, but maybe no longer appropriate and, and creating a new one. And um, after that, I found myself, um, I was at INSEAD Business School and I was teaching executives who were not um, interested in changing careers, at least not at that moment. We're all interested at one point or another. Right. But they were, um, they were um, trying to figure out how to step up to bigger leadership roles. And, and, and they were, by and large, people who were subject matter experts, you know, engineers, tech people, whose identity was really anchored in that stuff that they did. And of course, that was always the impediment to stepping up into roles in which you have to let go of some of what you have been. And so that's, that's where the seed got planted. That's where I started. And so I just, I started to study uh, the people that I was teaching uh, as they went through those transitions. And I, I mean, I already had a lot of insight from, from teaching them and understanding what were the hurdles and the challenges. Mm. That's so great. I, I love that that came about. Um, was it, I'm just curious for people who might be interested, was it hard to find some, uh, you know, a publisher or was that process, you know, because of all of your outreach pretty easy? 
that process was was it was very easy in that my former publisher, the publisher of my first book, had a contract that's with true. me that they had first dibs on the sun, whatever was. The oh, next that's book. so great. Yeah. So they were like, we are in. We are totally in with this. You know, they I mean, were I, I could have I could have rejected their offer, which I did not. They're still my publisher, but uh, they had they had um, nice. contracted in for the option to be first. <laughs> oh, that's so great. Yeah. It's like get your foot in and then there's, you know, probably things get a lot easier. So I'd love to talk a bit about there's like a bunch of things in this book that were super interesting to me. And one of the most was this notion of outsight, which I'd not heard of before. So I'm curious if you could tell us what is outsight and why is it so important for leaders? Okay. Well, you wouldn't have heard of it because I made it up. <laughs> That's what I thought. I was like, I'm pretty sure this is a new, a new concept she created. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I made it up to, to make a contrast with, um, with insight that comes from self-reflection, which is always important. But I felt that in the world in which we were operating, um, we were getting too carried away with encouraging people to spend a lot of time reflecting on what they really wanted and what they needed to do and to kind of excavate from inside themselves the solution. When in fact, in these situations in which you are looking to step up to something that you've never done before that's unfamiliar, um, that's not necessarily going to be helpful because you have nothing inside you to help you to help you do that. And instead, what you need to do is is get a fresh perspective that comes from doing new and different things with new and different people. And I call that outside to contrast the, that learning by doing from the more reflective internal uh, kind of introspective kind of learning. What, which it strikes me too that learning by doing is a lot of way we learn in general, right? Like why wouldn't, and I'm like, oh yeah, that makes total sense. Why wouldn't we apply that to leadership? But look, I mean, but look at what else makes no sense then. It's we know we learn by doing, right? And then you've got people in jobs that take up all their time in which they're essentially doing the same thing they've been doing for a very long time. And so how are they going to learn? And so then people thought, all right, let's give them little reflective exercises or let's, mm. you know, but that's not how. And that's why. Um, one of the big themes that came out of that book is that you have to make your day job a platform for your learning as well, because otherwise you're not going to learn what you need to do to even figure out if you want to move up or if you want to move out or if you want to move across. You have to create that capacity because that is the only way we learn by doing. Of course, you can every once in a while you can go and do a workshop or go to a course. And those things help a lot, but that learning is very, very limited if you don't put it into practice pretty much immediately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that really stood out to me. I thought to myself, wow, have I ever fallen guilty of that? I'm like, mm, I don't think so. But that really struck me, you know, as someone in the leadership space as a really unique and interesting perspective that I think we can all take. It's like, yes, our managers and leaders help us, but we also need to learn we need to take that upon ourselves to take that learning on for ourselves to change something so that we understand what it is that we want. And we learn by, and by doing that, by doing something different. Yeah. No. Mm, yeah, I love that. So how does somebody know when it's time to step up and change their behavior? That's a really good question because a lot of times you don't. It's, hmm. easier, <laughs> it, it's easier to know it if you've moved into a new job or if you've moved to a new organization, at least you've got something that blinks at you. This is different. <laughs> yeah, like a warning panel, different, yeah. different. <laughs> What's harder, and it's actually the more typical case, is you're in your job, maybe you've been in it two or three years, maybe even more, and slowly the environment around you has been changing and slowly the organization has been changing. And slowly expectations of you have been changing, but you don't have that benefit of the new title with people treating you differently. And you don't know if the time is, is, is it now? Is it, you know, do I have another month? Was it three months ago? You know, when is the time when I really have to start stepping up and doing things differently? And you know, especially if you're successful, you're doing something, it's not enough to keep repeating that. People start to expect more of you. And it sometimes it's just really hard to know. Mm. 
Yeah, it reminds me of something that, you know, like some of my folks talk to me about, which is the idea of like promotion, like, oh, I get promoted and then maybe then I'll get, I'll act different. I get promoted to be a leader and then I'll act different and I'll change my behavior. And I'm curious what you think about that notion, well, how all this relates to that. I mean, it, it, it all depends, but in a lot of organizations is there's this idea of performance versus potential and, and, and on what basis do you get promoted? And in a lot of places, it's not enough to perform to get promoted. People also have to see you as having the potential to be good in a different capacity. And the only way you see that is because people start stepping up already and start doing things and start, you know, providing more ideas rather than just executing or, you um, signing up to do things outside their immediate area so they have a bigger picture perspective you know that kind of stuff getting better about developing their people and and so um so it's it's important not just to do well but to signal that you also have some of those qualities that will be more important one or two levels up and that's why, you know, when I talk about the importance of redefining your job, well, all I'm saying is don't just take your day job as it's defined by other people for you, you define it too. And you try to expand it in a way that allows you to learn and to show that you can do things that are at a, a more senior level. Mm, I, it really strikes me too that you have to also just show it, make it, make that work visible. It's not like you, you know, people aren't necessarily, oh, you've been here four years. Now you get this promotion. You have to really show and make visible the potential that you have is what I hear from what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, give the conversations leaders, I have conversations like this with leaders all the time when people are frustrated and, you know, uh, struggling to figure out how do I step up and what does it mean and how do I get into more of a leadership position? So I think it's a great question. You have a really nice assessment in the, in the book too. For those of you who haven't read the book, do read it and look at the assessment because there's some really great um, things in there. Um, so one thing you also mentioned that I really loved was the do-it-yourself transition. Can you um, tell us like, what is it? And then what's the biggest challenge of the do-it-yourself transition? Right. It really is what we were just talking about. It, mm -hmm. It's a transition that doesn't come with a job title change. It doesn't come with a new job. It's, it's you saying, all right, I'm stepping up. I'm adding this. I'm subtracting that. I'm crafting my job. I'm positioning myself. I'm learning in this area. I'm adding value in this way. It's, it's you. You take control of it. Mm. What do you think is hard for people about that? Like the biggest challenge of stepping up, what do you find is where people get stuck maybe? Well, you know, it takes, I think, I think the hardest thing is always to step back from the immediate, you know, in the immediate, you have a deadline and a full inbox and a this and a that and, a busy, <laughs> and it, it can fill up more than your day. And in order to do the things that I'm talking about, you have to step back from it and say, okay, wait here, what's important? What's taking too much time? Where can I claw back some time to do some of these things? And, and so already just taking that step back to say, what do I wanna do here is challenging because it's so easy to just wake up and plunge into the routine, wake up and plunge into the routine. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think that's really challenging. Then the second thing that's really challenging is, the routine can be super rewarding because it's things that, that we do really well. And oftentimes things that we have, we've, we've liked very much. We do well, we like it. It's kind of effortless. Other people see us as the go-to person for that. And so it, it, it's very rewarding. It's very ego rewarding. You don't have to think about it too hard. Um, and then, you know, you start, carving out time to do other things that are more learning oriented and you're crap at it because you're not, you know, you, you're not practiced. They're not, they haven't been your bread and butter. And so you've got this contrast between the stuff that you can do in your sleep. You're going to get yep. a lot of kudos. And then this other stuff with is like, you know, you don't know if you're doing a good job or not. You're not getting the good feedback. But you're right. not you know how whenever whenever you've had a really challenging time of it, you say, I learned so much, but it, it actually means that 
<laughs> that's the problem with any situation in which you're learning it's not immediately rewarding it's really it can be really horrible I say that all the time about my COO experience. I learned so much. And, you, and, and we know what you meant, right? <laughs> ah. I, it was really hard, you know, like, whew. yeah, exactly. I say, I, I laugh because I literally have said that. I'm like, I can't say that I loved it, but what I loved about it was I kept learning and I was uncomfortable. It really took me get being willing to push beyond, you know, like, I love what you say in the book, the way you think is a product of your past experience and that that's not necessarily amazing. You know, there can be pitfalls when you want to step up into more leadership. The way you think is a product of your past experience. Your past experience was in a certain context, in a certain situation. If you find yourself in a different situation, it may not be up. That way of thinking may not be applicable. It could just send you down the wrong path. Mm -hmm. Yep. I talk about this a lot with folks. I see that as a, a really big problem with like, I work with a lot with, of new leaders and they keep trying to do the same old thing. And I'm like, right, but you're in a new context. What you got there won't get you here. For me, a lot of them are like, they go back down into executing and digging into the, like I call digging in the organizational dirt, you know, getting things done rather than saying, oh, I need to think, I need to guide, I need to be strategic, I need to build capacity. Um, that's hard to do. They know that's the right answer, but it's hard to do. <laughs> they don't know how to do it. You know, it's like, all right, today I'm going to wake up and I'm going to be strategic. <laughs> what does that actually mean? What's the activity? What, what are you going to cross off the list? And right, right, right. Check it off. Yep. What are you going to cross off the list? And, and it's people have to understand that being strategic is not a task. It's not an activity. It's a mindset that you apply to everything that you do and, and, and a mindset that helps you decide what you do, what you don't do, what you invest more time in, what you invest less time in. So it's, it's, um, it's hard for people to do it because they know how to execute. They just don't know how to be strategic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that idea of checking it off a list really comes into play, into play there. And strategic is one of the things where I think I'll, I hear a lot about people are, think about that quite a bit. And I think complicating it too is, oh, sorry to interrupt you. Um, no. I was, I was going to say, I think complicating it too is like learning doesn't feel fun and being uncomfortable doesn't feel fun and leaders are often doing it more publicly because as you get on, a, if, as you step up, you get more visibility, great for your career, but also, oh my gosh, now I'm, I don't know if I'm failing and I don't know if I'm doing the right things in front of a whole bigger audience. Mm -hmm which adds pressure, you know, to the whole equation. I mean, I know I felt that, you know, I had to really work on, that's okay, you're gonna make mistakes, keep learning, keep pushing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious, you know, in the book, you talk about some key skills that distinguish the most successful leaders from the rest, you know, like what, what might, what are maybe some skills or things that successful leaders do that maybe less effective ones don't? Well, you know, it's it's not necessarily it, it's not necessarily skills. It's it's how you mm. use your time. What are the things you spend mm. time on? And I guess you could see it as a skill. One of them is building networks effectively, building you know, building mm. strategic networks, um, relationships with people who will help you. You will help them. Um, will give you information. Will keep you posted. You can. Um, you can reach through them to get connected to elsewhere. You know, it's so, so much of what we do is through relationships and reciprocal relationships. And it's a real skill to, um, to have that in mind and to build them on a regular basis and to maintain those contacts and, and to really have that be a priority in what you do. I think that's a very, that's a very important one. Um, mm. Yeah, I think a lot, I think you're right. I, I know, I talk about that with folks all the time too. And like, I don't have time for networking. I, I'm focused on the work. It's like where their lens goes. I don't know that they always see the leverage they can gain from those networks. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that I think that's right. I mean, it's there's lots of different skill sets, but I think what we're talking about really is making a shift from doing things to building relationships, communicating, developing people. It's, it's, it's just a different set of activities that you need to get yourself involved in as you step up to the leadership roles. Yeah, and I think often about that one of the key points where folks 
have to work is not, they, they understand how to work up and down, but sometimes that working across, again, building relationships cross-functionally so they can work more organizationally as they wanna step more into leadership, you are doing more cross-functional and organizational work. And that's how you get the big picture view is, is by, by looking across. Otherwise you won't get the big picture view. You get the silo view. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And I find that that struggles with people, for, or people struggle with that. I mean, what do you think, you know, is the biggest mistake we make when it comes to networking at this level? It, is it just not doing it enough or are there other things? Well, the biggest mistake is not doing it. I think that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the mistakes come in, in the way we think about it. You know, it's mm. it's using people, it's political, it's mm. disingenuous, it's um, you know, I don't want to get involved in that. It's 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 who you know rather than what you know, as if you could really separate those things out. So so it's it's those mindsets that make it out to be something a little sleazy when in fact it is how we get things done and it is how we learn uh, past a certain point in our careers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is true that we definitely have a, uh, I think we have like some outdated perspectives on what networking means and, and negative things that get in our way. You know, I think that's a to get really comfortable would be is super helpful. Um, you know, and speaking of a little bit around mindsets, you know, um, I was thinking about like authenticity and you talk about authenticity in there and authenticity traps, you know, and, and, and I'm just curious about how leaders, those stepping up can get caught into those authenticity traps. Cause you talk about a story about changing your style in the book and, and, and authenticity. And I just wondered if you could speak a little bit to that. Sure. So when we're stepping up into bigger leadership roles, it's not just, um, it, it, it's it's not just adding new skills like you would you know add a new tool in a toolkit you also have to you you have to modify your style how you communicate how you build relationships with people the kind of image you convey all of those things and and for people doing those things feels like it's touching at the very heart of who they are and and in many times they will feel um, that they are being asked to choose between being themselves and doing what it takes to be successful. And, mm. and they're defining what it takes to, you know, being myself in terms of me historically, how I've always been, which is obviously going to be a little different than what it takes to be <laughs> successful. And, and sometimes that feels like, um, like a sacrifice or it feels like, it, it feels like I'm being asked to be inauthentic. Um, and, and particularly when um, we're a little bit ambivalent, you know, we feel like, mm -hmm. oh, you know, those senior people haven't got a clue or, you know, they're <gasps> all about, or they're all about the form rather than the substance. And I'm a lot more substantive or that's where it gets political. Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh, I'm not I'm not that kind of person. Not me. <laughs> no. I'm not that person. We have a lot of attitudes about leaders, don't we? Right. Yeah. They're incompetent or they don't care or, you know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> And, and, and so, so you use that nice view of yourself in contrast to everybody else as an excuse to not push outside your comfort zone when in fact, nobody's asking you to violate ethical standards or anything of that sort. They're just asking you to maybe, you know, put yourself in the shoes of the other person and communicate differently or pay attention to how you're coming across to other people or, you know, just, uh, or adapt your style so that it's more motivational for them. Those are things. And when we haven't done those things before, they don't feel natural. And you're, you know, it feels contrived. It feels like you're acting, you know, even, you know, people who are not good listeners, for example, when they're trying to up their listening skills, they feel hugely inauthentic because they're, you know, they're trying to go, yes, uh huh, yeah, mm -hmm, and be <laughs> listening and say back to you what you've just said. And they feel like idiots <laughs> because it's not natural and it's not habitual. And so my whole point on that, um, the authenticity traps is be careful when you say to yourself, well, that's not me. Is it is it truly is it is it truly not you in in the general sense or is it just that you haven't learned it yet or you haven't done it yet and so you feel uncomfortable, and and adapting your style is 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 an uncomfortable thing. Yeah, and I think it's a really fine, interesting, great point you made there, which is there's a difference between changing who you are, identity, and adapting your style. Those are two quite different things that I think. 
you know. But it feels similar to people, yeah. you know, like, look, people who have to all of a sudden be giving more presentations, for example, and, and they know their presentations are dry and a little bit boring, but they don't really, they've never really cultivated a sense of humor. And they're thinking, gee, what do I need to do to liven this up? And they, they feel very inauthentic when they steal a joke from somebody and throw it into the presentation as a way of trying to lighten up. But that's, that's why I call, I call that being more playful with your sense of self in the book, mm. because what that means is you're giving yourself permission to deviate from how you've always done things for the sake of learning. And maybe you'll decide, okay, I'm not, the, I'm not ever going to be the kind of person who throws jokes into presentations, but you will never know that unless you try. You know, you could be surprised. You could end up having a great experience. You joke kind of puts everybody in a good mood. All of a sudden it's a great meeting and you say, oh gosh, I should, I should try that again. <laughs> and that's, that's yeah. the learning by doing bit as opposed to try to think it all through, try mm. some things that you've not tried before that might feel inauthentic at first because you haven't tried them before. And you might just learn something that is gonna be valuable to you for the future. Yeah, I love that too. I, I do think sometimes we think we can think it through and I always call those tunnels with no cheese. Like there's just no tunnel. There's no cheese down that tunnel. We need to get into action. And I know when I wanted to, I needed to work on getting my business out there and sharing my work. And so I tried speaking. And what I discovered is like, I don't think I'm a great like presenter. I'm really good in conversation and I didn't feel good about it. I don't think I did a great job at it. And then I learned, oh, I'm good on panels. Oh, I'm good in collaboration and conversation. But I wouldn't have known that. And I spent a lot of time, by the way, thinking I had to be a speaker. And, you know, in order to get myself out there and, and promote the work and, and serve more people. And it was the truth was I only learned that by doing it. Yeah, well, that's the whole point. That's the whole point of outside is learn more by doing. Mm, I, I love that. I have two last quick questions for you. Um, was there anything on your research that you've done? Because you've done a, quite a bit of research in these fields, you know, um, that might surprise us. Well, that's a hard question. <laughs> I don't know. Try the second question and while I mold yeah. that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the next question is, where are you headed into your, in your work and your research? You know, what's next so, for you? So I've got two, two different avenues on. Um, one I've been looking at, um, it started out really looking at um, leadership skills for, for digital transformation um, for, you know, in organizations that were either, you know, le legacy organizations that really needed to do digital transformation. And, and for those who are more born digital, the kind of the whole scaling up and becoming bigger and more widespread, you know, what are those skills that are involved? In, but actually with the pandemic over this past year, it has really turned much more into what are leadership skills for um, helping your organization be more of a learning organization, essentially. Mm. You know, I think that's, that's really what it boils down to because, you know, who knows what's going to come at you out of the blue? I mean, look at what's happened <laughs> over the last year. So I've been I've been working a bit on that, and then um, and then I'm also writing a new book, which is a sequel to my first about uh, about career transitions. The first one was really about the mid career, age mm. forty ish plus or minus, even though it's broader than that. And um, as I get older, I've become interested in, in this, um, this new phase uh, with all of, you know, very few of us going into any kind of conventional retirement or pre-retirement period, but still wanting yet another kind of reinvention for this stage. And so looking at that, the, the, how we um, rework yeah. our working identities a little bit later in our careers. So I'm working oh on- Oh my God. I love that. That's so great. If you have time for one more question, we actually had a question come okay. in. Okay. Okay. Um, this is um, from Joy. Um, this resonates a lot with me. I think partly the tech um, SME um, to management trope is that we aren't natural leaders, um, people, people. And I wonder if that reinforces some of that confidence, lack slash discomfort. Um, it's also borderline imposter syndrome, perhaps. Yeah. What are your thoughts? Yeah, what are your thoughts on that? 
So, so the, the, I want to make sure I understood. The question is that the the stereotype is that engineering tech type people are not good people. People and yep, yep. Yes, that's a stereotype that's there, and some of us fit it, and some of us don't, right? But you see also lots of um, lots of people in tech who are great, who are great leaders. There's a story I love about this because I I, um, I wrote a series of case studies about Microsoft and their transformation under Satya Nadella, and he's a big mm. proponent of what's called a growth mindset, which is if you believe. Mm that with learning and uh, with practice and effort, you can get better at almost everything, which is what the research says, you'll do it and you'll get and you'll get the help. But he has these great stories he tells about, you know, how clueless he was when he was younger in terms of something he thinks is really important now, which is empathy. And he just tells some stories about, you know, things that happened to him where he didn't have the empathy and he realized he didn't have it and how he came to see how important it was and he cultivated it. And now, you know, it's, it's very much a part of his leadership style. And so there's nothing that says you can't go against the grain. Yeah, I love that too. That growth mindset's really important to it's like how we see ourselves. And it goes back, I think, to like identity and how we view ourselves and whether that's fixed or not, or whether we can adapt. Um, yeah, thank you so much for joining us this session. Yeah. Um, so yeah. great to have you. Such a fun, lively conversation. Um, our next session will be on June 1st, where we'll be talking to Cherie Etchison about demanding more. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. Bye.